How's it going, everyone? It's Sam. Today we have with us a pro trader, Boris, who's coming on the channel. He worked at Bloomberg. He traded full time for years. Now he's at a major crypto exchange. Boris, thanks for coming on. Yeah, thank you for having me on, Sam. It's uh, great to be here. Yeah, definitely. Maybe you can give us a little bit more explanation about your background, what you're doing right now, and then we can jump into what's going to happen in the near future with the Bitcoin having, where people can find more about you, uh, what happened with the Bitcoin ETFs and all that. But maybe we start with you. Yeah, yeah sure. Um, so yeah, I've been trading full time for about uh, four years now. I made the leap into full time crypto trading shortly before the pandemic hit in uh, March of 2020, which was you know a very volatile time to make the leap into full time trading, whether it was crypto or equity trading. Uh, but before that, I was uh, I was working in traditional finance. I started off working in Bloomberg, and then I transitioned over to a company called uh, Prequin, where I did research on alternative assets, mainly focusing on hedge funds. And that's what really gave me the inspiration to uh, to really learn about trading and different trading methodologies. Uh, because in that job, uh, I really had to talk with different hedge fund managers within the industry. And uh, just just by speaking with them, I realized not all of them are, uh, you know, rocket scientists like a lot of people uh, think they are. Uh, they're just normal people like you, you and me, who are very passionate uh, about about trading and different trading strategies. So that basically gave me the inspiration to uh, learn more about like different trading strategies and risk management myself. So slowly over time, I uh, yeah, in, in my spare time, I basically spent uh my entire time just learning about trading uh just reading different trading books and eventually uh yeah i made i made the leap after a few years um like i said right before the pandemic hit and uh yeah i became a full-time trader and uh just a year ago i joined uh coin w as a, a copy master trader and analyst and yeah th that, that's what brings me here today uh chatting with you Great. I mean, you're the person to talk to then. Obviously, the ETFs have been uh, explosive, I think, surpassing everyone's expectations. Obviously, with you working with hedge funds and alternative assets, this is going to be perfect. Uh, I think maybe, though, before we get into the e ETFs, usually people hold this until the end, but I'm sure people will want to follow you. So I want to just quick plug where people can follow you, and we'll have links to this underneath the video as well. Sure. Uh, so... Yeah, on Twitter or on X, you can follow me. My handle is uh, Satoshi Boris, and I go by the su uh, pseudonym Mister Mister X. And uh, on Instagram, I'm also I, I just kind of like restarted my uh, Instagram account. Uh, it's focused on trading, uh, and you can find me there under uh, Mister X. So that's M R X as well. Uh, right. And that's yeah, that's mainly where I do most of my uh, social media. And Great. yeah, I also I'm on Telegram. Uh, I'm in the obviously the Telegram group that you're in. Wow, uh, yeah. that's associated with Point W. So you can find all my updates and uh, and the daily trade analysis on there as well. Yeah, so we'll link Coin W as well, so you can start trading there, and then you get access to the pro trading group with Boris in there. Let's start with the ETFs. Obviously, that's been one of the largest catalysts I think in recent history. They did better than most people expected. We have more ETFs possibly coming even next week with Hong Kong. Let's start there. What are your opinions of how they've gone so far? Yes, I think the ETFs have gone. They've gone amazing. Uh, so honestly, be before uh, the ETFs launched, I my opinion was that it's going to be a sell the news event. And right after the ETFs launched, uh, you know, the price of Bitcoin would go down um uh, but obviously that that was wrong uh since the etfs have launched price has gone uh gone from forty five thousand to currently about uh seventy thousand dollars as of the time we're recording this video so i think the etfs have been a tremendous success um I, we have a uh, total net assets of over 60 billion now uh in aggregate across the blackrock uh the uh, fidelity you know the the grayscale ETFs, and um, yeah, we have total net inflows of about. Uh, there's some good data from uh, Bitmex Research, uh, which I follow. So the total net, uh, yeah, total net 
assets now stand at 12, yeah, 12, sorry, it's 59 billion right now. And the yeah. total net inflow is uh, 12 billion. So yeah, obviously we're getting a tremendous amount of inflows. And I do think that is what is contributing to the current price rise in in Bitcoin as well. Yeah, who's buying this? Obviously, like a lot of people are saying that financial advisors aren't even selling them yet. Obviously, you're plugged into hedge funds. Are hedge funds buying? Is it mostly uh, you and me buying, maybe selling some of our Bitcoin so that we can sell options on it one day or so that we can have easier access to loans? Who's actually buying, do you think? I think a lot of it is definitely institutional uh, investors. Uh, because obviously before the ETFs launched, the big problem with uh, asset managers and hedge funds is that it was very hard to get exposure uh, to Bitcoin just because of you know the, the problem with uh, custody solutions and all of that. But obviously that problem has been solved now with the launch of the ETFs. So I do think um, you know when we're talking about total net assets of $60 billion, uh, that's, that's not retail investors, that's definitely institutional driven activity uh so i guess we you know we can we can thank blackrock for the uh price appreciation uh in bitcoin right now uh but obviously um you know the uh, there is a lot of retail uh contribution as well um but i think a lot of it is driven by you know by the big by the big institutions uh yeah just and and just uh an observation that i've noticed Especially when the New York, uh, the, when the New York market opens, that's when we see, that's when we start to see a lot of uh, volatility start to spike up uh, in in the Bitcoin space. Uh, so if uh, if you've noticed, uh, usually during the Asian session, if price does drop, by the time the New York market opens, uh, basically the uh, I guess the New York institutions they they buy the dip. So that pattern has been going on pretty much ever since the. ETFs have launched. So there's definitely been a correlation between uh you know the New York Stock Exchange session and uh and just the volatility and the price appreciation we're seeing within Bitcoin uh basically uh during New York market session hours. Yeah, definitely. And next week we're supposedly getting Hong Kong approval for ETFs. Do you think that changes where maybe Hong Kong doesn't dump or the Asian countries don't dump in the middle of the night? Or do you think it's just going to be more of the same? Um, yeah. So since, uh, uh, yeah, if the Hong Kong approval goes through, I think that's probably even, that's probably going to be even more bullish because yeah, I mean, if the Asian countries are now getting involved, then that that's just more exposure for, you know, the Asian hedge fund managers and the Asian institutions. Uh, I've said, I don't know much about the, uh, you know the Asian institutional investors as much as I do about the uh, you know American investors, but uh, yeah, as long as more ETFs gets added get added to different exchanges across the world, I think it's uh, definitely a, a bullish thing for sure. So uh, one more thing I wanted to point out is uh, the year-to-date ETF flows across all categories. Uh, so we can see here that uh, spot Bitcoin is actually at the top of the list here. Uh, so it's above even uh, bonds and the tech sector and pretty much you know all other ETF categories such as emerging markets and real estate. And then we can see down below what's at the bottom here. It's actually gold. Uh, so we're seeing close to uh, 5 billion in net outflows out of the, uh, the gold ETFs. And you know, we're basically seeing close to like 4x the amount of inflows into uh, spot Bitcoin. Uh, so I just wanted to point that out, uh, you know, given that both gold and Bitcoin are currently at all time highs, uh, there is nonetheless more a lot more inflows going into Bitcoin uh, versus gold. And I, and I think the reason for that is because, uh, you know, when we're talking about gold versus Bitcoin and which is a better store of value? Uh, you know, I think the narrative right now is that you know Bitcoin is 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 basically digital gold, and mm -hmm. uh, you know we can do like a whole separate video about uh, gold versus uh, Bitcoin and you know uh, how how they compare as store of values. But 
but yeah, I just wanted to point that out that uh, we're seeing a lot of inflows into the spot Bitcoin ETFs and uh, outflows out of gold, and uh, probably you know we're <laughs> probably the same thing is happening to uh, silver and the S SLV ETF. And uh, also, key thing to note is that Bitcoin actually did overtake uh, the silver uh, the silver market cap with the recent move to basically seventy thousand dollars. So that's that's pretty big given that silver is you know one of the major commodities so yeah that's just one more thing i wanted to point out in terms of uh you know the spot etf flows i saw too recently uh, i think it was just this morning blackrock announced earnings and i saw a tweet saying that 20 percent of their inflows for the quarter were uh bitcoin etfs like 20 percent of their net flows which is interesting obviously uh they're going to be pushing that. And I saw it too. They just started advertising on Bloomberg. So like, yeah, yeah, it's going to probably continue. Yeah. And actually uh, another thing is, um, so they're going to start re recently. There was a news article that um, uh, BlackRock is going to start allocating their, uh, basically their own Bitcoin ETF into their, uh, basically their global, uh, their global ETFs. So basically that's going to even push the price of uh, Bitcoin even higher. So basically they're going to, so they basically have like other mutual funds uh, and they're basically going to be allocating uh, like their own ETF into those uh, like global ETFs, if that makes sense. Yeah. So yeah, pretty, you, pretty big. Uh, yeah. That's pretty big. Yeah. Which is huge. Cause uh, from the, from what I've seen, there are two ETFs that they're trying to get, uh, or that they told the SEC that they're going to do that for, and they hold about $50 billion. So I mean, you go put a chunk of that in Bitcoin, no one has to approve that. No one has to make uh, or go to Fidelity and hit buy or anything like that. They just shift it around themselves. And then investors aren't going to jump out of the ETF. So they're uh, because of that. I mean, so they're just essentially just buying more Bitcoin from themselves and no yeah. one has to do anything. Yeah, exactly. And that that kind of creates like a I guess almost like an infinity loop, right? Yeah. Um and also like again, this is like something that wasn't really priced in to the market, I don't think, despite people knowing that, you know, we were probably we were we were gonna have the ETF approval and it was highly likely. Uh you know, no no one saw that there's gonna be so much uh allocation coming from institutional investors and that, you know, BlackRock is gonna start allocating uh their own bitcoin etfs into yeah. into more of like their global macro etf so yeah. so yeah it's, this is this is a really big you know fundamental event with the uh w with the launch of the bitcoin etf so re really exciting times ahead i'm really yeah. excited to see what the price of bitcoin is going to be uh later this year I made a spreadsheet on this too, and we'll move on in a second, but I did make a spreadsheet and I showed in a couple of videos, like why BlackRock might want to allocate into uh, the Bitcoin ETF. And right now, one of those funds that they're talking about buying uh, Bitcoin in, they have treasuries, they have bonds, um, they're talking about adding Bitcoin, but they don't make anything from the back end of that. Like they buy, they have that 0.8% fee, I think I saw on there. And that's it. But then when they're buying the Bitcoin ETFs through that, they get the 0.2% fee from the Bitcoin ETF and the 0.8% fee. And they're only allocating a small amount towards Bitcoin. But if Bitcoin goes where we're talking about, maybe 200, 300,000, they put 10% of that into Bitcoin or you know maybe 1%, whatever. It balloons the AUM, which is the higher fee number anyways. So like they yeah. can charge the 0.8% on the bigger total AUM now because of the outperformance in Bitcoin compared to getting, you know, a couple percent on treasuries or bonds or something like that. So it does make it really attractive when you can put a high alpha, um, a high, high return asset in something like that, which is interesting. And it's hard to explain it without going through all the numbers. But uh, yeah, it is kind of crazy to think about how attractive that is to some of these ETF issuers. Yeah. Uh, and especially when you mentioned the uh the actual fees for the etfs uh you know i think i uh i bet which is a black rocks etf has one of the lowest fees in comparison to like uh the grayscale uh etf mm -hmm. which is why we're actually we've been seeing a lot of outflows from great grayscale uh so there's a lot of uh competition between you know i and uh you know the van etf and uh the arc 
uh, you know, Caffey Woods ETF as well. Um, so, so, so yeah, def, uh, that's definitely a good point. Uh, and also what, one thing I wanted to kind of point out is that with, you know, with all these inflows into the ETFs, I think, you know, one, like one thing to keep in mind is that if we do start to see like a risk off sell off within the global, just the overall global markets, that's gonna force, um, you know, perhaps uh, force people to sell the the ETFs because right now we we're, we're predominantly we've we've predominantly been seeing uh, an inflow of uh, of assets into the Bitcoin ETFs, and we haven't really seen uh, like uh, outflow like on a weekly time scale. There have been some outflows, uh, you know, day to day, but. Uh, when you zoom out to the weekly and monthly time frame, we've been in an uptrend in terms of the Bitcoin inflows. Um, so one thing I'm concerned about is that if we start to see uh, a sell-off in the ETFs, that actually might be uh, that, that might also be a catalyst for Bitcoin to go down as well. So I just wanted to point out the you know things might not just continue to go up. There is you know things can go down, and if you know we do start to see more of a global macro uh sell-off then perhaps you know the the etfs could could also act as a basically as a catalyst for the price of bitcoin to go down as well yeah, two sides to the coin there yep. yeah exactly we talked about etfs that happened months ago but obviously in the very near future we have what's traditionally the biggest catalyst in bitcoin at least causes the most volatility the having what are your thoughts uh, is it something good long term obviously it is but do you think it do you think it affects the price short term at all and uh how how do you think you should play it yeah uh it's a great question i actually did um <clears throat> i tried to do a bit of a thorough analysis on this um so i went i went i basically went through uh the past few havings and tried to see what data i could come up with uh, so I, I went back to the previous three halvings. Now, obviously, we don't have uh, too many uh, data points to go off of, but nonetheless, I thought I could do some data analysis. Um, so what I found is, um, yeah, essentially, uh, I did an average of what was the Bitcoin uh, percent uh, price increase one month before the halving, and then one month after, then six months after, and then uh one year after so essentially this is what i found um uh, so on average 30 days le leading up to the halving we have about a 16.6 percent increase in the price of bitcoin uh one month after there's about a 4.38 percent increase on average um and then really the price of bitcoin doesn't really start rallying until uh you know several months after the halving so six months after the having uh there's a average percentage increase of about 316 percent uh and then one year after there's an average uh increase of 2000 yeah it's a crazy number but 2772 percent um so now what i try to do here is i actually try to make some price projections based on you know the average percentage increase we've seen um you know one month before one month after six months after and then one year after yeah. so what i found is that um so about yeah so 30 days before the having where we were trading at a price of 67,900 we can call it 68,000 and so if we apply these averages uh to these numbers we can come up with a potential price projection of 79,000 uh on the day of the having and then one month after it's going to be eighty two thousand. Six months after it's going to be three hundred thirty thousand, and then one year after the having uh if we applied the same average we're looking at a price of two million two two hundred seventy two thousand dollars now of course these numbers are a bit crazy um so uh so the problem with making you know this kind of prediction or projections is that obviously you know when when bitcoin 
was uh, was trading back in November of 2013. We were at a price of uh, $12.30. So the market cap uh, was way, you know, was way, way lower than it is today. Uh, so I thought the best thing to do is, um, you know, we need to weigh these data points by market cap. Uh, so given that uh, Bitcoin is about 8x the market cap that it, that it was um, before the last halving, I thought the best thing to do is just divide all these numbers basically by eight so we can come up with like a weighted, um, you know, a weighted ca calculation by market cap. And so then with these averages, what I found is that uh, so one month before the halving, uh, we should see a price appreciation of about 2%, which would land Bitcoin uh, actually right, right around the price we're trading right now at about $69,000. And then one month after, you know, we'll still be trading about at about seventy thousand. And then six months after the having, uh, we'll be getting close to that hundred k uh, mark that a lot of uh, you know a lot of crypto, I guess crypto talking heads are talking about, like Kathy Wood and Michael Michael Saylor. And then uh, one year after the having, we could be trading at three hundred eleven thousand um, dollars. So yeah, that was, that was kind of long, but no, um, yeah, that, uh, those are my spreadsheets. Uh, I've done many of yeah. these on my channel before, and I think uh -huh. it is important for people to understand too that it's not Boris saying that this is going to happen. This is based on prior results, uh, and obviously things can change. More of a uh, less of a prediction, I would assume, than just running the numbers this is what has historically happened and this is what would happen in the future based on those previous uh results but it does make sense to me those are similar numbers to what i have uh for kind of in my head and six months after obviously we could see some uh some friction around 100 a rejection or something and then the one year after do you think that's going to be peaking us out around three hundred and eleven thousand? about it would be about half the market cap of gold at that point. Do you think that's where we peak out one year after, or do you think we have further to go after that? Yeah, I mean that's a great question. To uh, to to be honest, um, if, if we're just going by the data, uh, and again, there's not there's only three data points, so it's not enough to make like a statistically, I guess a, a statistically probable analysis, but. Um, you know, if if we are just to go by these data points, I think, yeah, I think it's quite possible that we will be trading at three hundred thousand one year after the having. So, yeah, on April twentieth of twenty twenty five, we should be around that. Yeah, around that uh, price figure. Um, now, like you said, uh, that's going to be about half the market cap of gold uh, by that point. Uh, so do I think it's the, it's going to be the peak? I honestly have, I have no idea because this is like a, a one year, uh, possible projection and I'm more of a short-term trader, uh, you know, focusing on the daily to weekly time frame. So, uh, honestly, I don't, I don't know if that will be the peak. Um, I think, uh, I don't know, to be honest, I'm not, sure. I'm not, a you know, I'm not a complete wizard where I can make prediction, <laughs> uh, predictions one year in advance. But yeah, I'm sure okay. Michael, Sa Michael Saylor would say that, yeah, we're going to 500,000 or $1 million, but okay. I'm more, I'm more conservative. So I'll say, uh, you know, let's just get to hundred K first. Yeah, <laughs> fair say. enough. So maybe we can take a look at some on-chain metrics, maybe go to the shorter time frames that, uh, you typically look at because you know we are around the having a lot of people are going to tune in they're going to hear about it starting probably on monday uh hearing about the having in less than a week everyone's going to expect some volatility what do you what do you see out there um are we going to get some volatility and what what are on chain metrics showing us yeah sure so um really some of the on chain metrics that i like to look at are on uh coin glass uh so uh one of the first metrics I like to look at is open interest data and right now what we are seeing is that open interest is uh uh very close to to its highs so there's uh currently about let's see about 31 billion in uh futures open interest aggregated across all 
all exchanges, including uh, you know the leveraged futures exchanges like Bybit and uh, Binance and uh, CoinW, of course. Um, so what this represents is that there's a lot of uh, you know market interest in in Bitcoin. So people, you know, people are positioning uh, for the having. So, so that's one key metric. So uh, that that basically just represents that there is a lot of just yeah, just interest in the market. And since we are trading, you know, near the highs right now, uh, it is, in in my opinion, it is uh, it is a bullish thing. Uh, now, the the other thing I like to take a look at uh, is the liquidation heat maps. So let me just pull this up really quick. Mm-hmm. Um, Maybe you can explain to what the open interest actually is. Is it like options contracts, people taking short-term bets on Bitcoin? Uh, what does that really do to to the price? Like, does it make it more volatile? Because right now we're kind of just trending sideways. But I'm sure some people are now joining crypto and they want a, maybe a little bit more in-depth uh, idea of what that is. While this is loading, obviously yeah yeah so yeah so open interest basically re- represents uh just the amount of uh open positions that traders have um uh across uh the futures markets uh so it doesn't really include uh options data although uh that is a metric we can take a look at separately uh and basically uh, basically that uh, yeah basically the open interest uh just represents how much uh yeah, how much open bets there are across the the market so you know usually when for example if interest if open interest were low and price was going down that that would basically imply that there's just not a lot of interest across investors and, and other traders uh in the space uh ha- however given that open interest is at all-time highs right now and price is at all-time highs that does that does basically mean that uh people are positioning towards you know some kind of move uh and also we don't know uh whether these traders are positioned you know to the long side or the short side uh we just know that there is a lot of open yeah just o- open bets uh across the overall market uh okay. so yeah hope hope that makes sense uh to the viewers who are just tuning in yeah definitely. Um, i think that's helpful yeah and then yeah so the other key thing i like to look at especially now is uh are the liquidation heat maps um now for those who aren't familiar with what what these are this basically shows where uh you know different like longer short traders would be uh liquidated across uh futures exchanges so this is like a very key on-chain metric for me because now that we're you know basically at all-time highs uh you know like the usual technical analysis doesn't like help us as much just because we're kind of like in a you know a blue sky breakout mode so we need to we we do need to take a look at more uh on-chain activity to see what's happening uh but basically um the way to interpret this is we we can basically use this as uh you know support and resistance so basically you you can see that uh when price starts to touch these uh, liquidity zones it does tend to act as uh in this case as resistance because basically what we're looking at here is uh if price were to get above you know seventy two thousand dollars there would be uh, a total liquidation of about 320 million uh, for short traders, which is you know pretty significant. So, my interpretation is that uh, people who are positioned towards the short side, they are you know they are protecting their positions. However, if price were to break above this point, then that would basically liquidate all the short positions, and price would uh, basically start uh, to shoot up. A, uh, above seventy-two thousand dollars. Now, on the flip side, uh, we can also, you know, there's a flip side to this as well. So, uh, short, I mean, long positions can get liquidated as well. So we kind of just actually just saw this happen uh, just over the past day. So 
you can kind of see how uh, price was trading between these uh, like liquid zones is what I like to call them. And we kind of, yeah, we kind of like broke down uh, below $70,000 and this did uh, liquidate ab about a uh, hundred. Yeah, th there was probably close to a hundred million in uh, long liquidations. This is a better, kind of a better representation. So we can see here current price is 69,500. And if uh, price were to, you know, go below, let's say, sixty-eight thousand, there would be a cumulative lever uh, long leverage liquidation of over six hundred forty million dollars. Uh, so this is a very useful tool to uh, track, uh, you know, where basically long or short tr traders would be, basically would be uh, hurt the most. So this is definitely one. Uh, metric that I like to look at. Um, so can I stop you yeah. here for a second? Does this mean then that there are about two times as many people that would get wiped out from Bitcoin going up than going down since it looks like there's about twice the amount of uh, liquidations that would happen just from the height yeah. of those lines? Yeah, good question. So uh, when I like to look at this, I do want to see, uh, you know, which side are most traders positioned in so uh we can see here that yeah obviously there's a lot more uh traders positioned towards the short side actually so uh if we if we zoom in here we can see if price gets to seventy four thousand dollars right which is currently the the previous all-time high there would be a cumulative short uh liquidation leverage of over two billion dollars which is you know very significant uh however Towards the long side, we can see there's not as many long positions to be liquidated. Like if price were to go, let's say down to sixty-six thousand, which would be you know a pretty significant drop from the current price point, there would be one billion dollars, or shortly uh, a bit over one billion dollars in total liquidation. So we are looking at about uh, twice the amount of short positions being liquidated uh, versus long. So definitely the market is stacked towards. Uh, you know the shorts uh the shorts being liquidated and that would basically initiate um a short squeeze so so yeah uh definitely uh at this current point in time uh the market is position positioned towards squeezing out the shorts versus versus the longs mm, okay so would a trader and i'm sorry but if someone's looking at this for the first time they might be kind of just going through the process in my in their head so what you said before is basically okay there are more people that are short the market right now or they're going heavier on the short side so it might be that it's more suppressed like the price isn't going up as high we keep on hitting 71 72 because there are a lot of shorts that are protecting themselves but if we break out uh which will be harder to the upside than the downside based on this chart just on uh the liquidation map mm -hmm. we should have a more explosive move if is that basically if spot continues to buy push up the market then we get those liquidations then and then we have that short squeeze yeah yeah essentially that's the way that's the way to interpret this uh so so yeah if uh you know if if the buyers can break through that that pivot point of about uh 72,000 to 74,000 uh we should start to see price start to uh, really start to skyrocket because uh when we're talking about two billion dollars in in uh short positions being liquidated that is gonna force uh you know the short sellers to buy basically buy their positions and that's also gonna force um you know breakout traders to the long side to kind of like come into the market and and buy the breakout so so yeah that, that's the way i'm interpreting this so uh if price does get above uh let's call it like seventy two thousand dollars right now I do think we're going to start to see a short squeeze and probably Bitcoin uh, heading above uh, $74,000 and probably uh, going up to 80, 80K probably. Oh, okay, great. I, I've held you there long enough on that chart, but I uh, just definitely wanted to expand on that a little bit. If you want to keep on moving on to the other metrics though that you have. Yeah, yeah, sure. So another key metric is uh, Bitcoin dominance. So uh, for those who aren't familiar with what Bitcoin dominance is, it essentially measures uh, what the 
uh, market cap dominance of Bitcoin is relative to the overall crypto industry. Uh, so right now we're 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 at about fifty four point seven percent. So basically, that means that uh, Bitcoin is, you know, is essentially fifty four point seven percent of the entire uh, crypto market cap. Uh, but what we're seeing on a weekly time scale is that uh, Bitcoin dominance is actually breaking out towards the upside. Uh, so we've kind of been stuck in a sideways range for close to uh, several months now, really since October. And we are getting this uh, this move about the f- above the 54% threshold. And basically what this means is that more capital is flowing out of the altcoin sector and it's moving into Bitcoin. Um, so basically that means, yeah, there's just more capital flowing into Bitcoin and more money flowing out of the altcoins. And we can kind of see this right now. You know, Bitcoin is down about a percent uh, percent right now. And then if we, you know, if, if we actually look into the overall cryptocurrency heat map right now, uh, we'll see that a lot of the altcoins are down significantly more. So let me just pull this up really quickly. So yeah, Bitcoin is down, you know, kind of like a marginal amount, 0.9%, which isn't really that much when you consider the overall volatility of Bitcoin. Uh, but we can see that a lot of the altcoins are down uh, quite you know, quite significantly more. So Solana is down 3%, AVAX is down 4%. Um, and then you can see you know, Bitcoin Cash is down 5%. So, uh, so we can see that the altcoins are taking a bigger hit today as opposed to, as opposed to Bitcoin itself. So yeah, Bitcoin dominance is another uh, key metric that I, uh, yeah, that I like to look at. Um, yeah, I guess. Yeah. So we covered, um, uh, you know, liquidation heat maps, we covered open interest, we covered, uh, Bitcoin dominance, uh, ETF flows. So I think those are the main on chain metrics that I'm currently, uh, look, looking at. Is there, yeah. is, is there anything else, uh, you'd like to you'd like to know or discuss yeah just going back to bitcoin dominance uh based mm-hmm. on the chart where do you think it tops out at i mean it, if i remember right there is a big trend line going from i think it was maybe 2017 through the 2020 market through to now as well um and i'm curious where you think we kind of top out for bitcoin this cycle and how maybe the etfs affect that as well uh, since obviously hedge funds or uh, large institutions aren't going to be investing in Pepe, most likely through ETFs. I'm wondering <laughs> yeah. how that affects it. Yeah. So just looking at um, just looking at the weekly chart here, uh, where Bitcoin dominance tops out, um, honestly, the net. So first of all, it's kind of, it's kind of difficult to do technical analysis on uh, the Bitcoin dominance metric because it's not like we can trade it. But non- nonetheless, we, we can try to do some TA, TA, TA on this. Uh, so really, if Bitcoin can get, uh, if Bitcoin dominance can get above fifty-five uh, percent, we're really looking uh, the next kind of target for Bitcoin dominance of about fifty-eight percent. Um, and then ultimately, the the previous uh, high from uh, the previous market cycle in uh, twenty twenty was at about seventy percent. So. Yeah, really, I, I think if, uh, you know, the ETF flows continue going and Bitcoin dominance continues to go up, uh, yeah, we're probably going to hit about uh, 58% on Bitcoin dominance. Then ultimately, we're looking at uh, perhaps 70%. So, uh, yeah, and then that that would definitely initiate, uh, you know, a further price appreciation in Bitcoin itself. So, so yeah, Bitcoin dominance looks bullish. Uh, and obviously, this is not not bullish for uh for most of the uh altcoins right now sure fair enough okay last thing i really want to get into because we covered a lot about what's going to happen in the next couple weeks um when do you think you'll be taking profits uh or do you think you'll just ride it out because you know the best traders uh or maybe the best long-term holders are the ones that don't do anything but you seem like someone that would be looking to take profits based on the fact that you're more of a short-term trader. Uh, what, do, what do you think about that for people that may be trying to get out at the next during this next cycle and take some profits towards the top? 
Yeah, it's a great, uh, it's a great question. So, uh, first of all, you need to separate your uh, trading portfolio versus your, you know, I guess your, uh, just like your long term holdings. So, as far as uh, you know, trading goes, um, I like to, you know, I like to consistently take uh, take profits. So, you know, I really like to take profits basically at every major uh psychological you know resistance point so if, if bitcoin were to break above seventy four thousand dollars which is the current high you know i'll probably be taking some profits at eighty thousand then ninety then a hundred thousand uh now that this is this is just strictly talking about uh, uh my active uh trading positions uh, as far as like uh bitcoin itself uh and holding bitcoin for the long term, uh, I just pulled up a chart of Bitcoin on the uh, on the quarterly time frame, which is a time frame not many uh, people look at. Uh, and what we can see is that basically, you know, if you really zoom out, Bitcoin has just been an uptrend ever since its inception. Uh, so really, if you're if you're holding Bitcoin, I see no reason to like. I mean, obviously, like you should take some profits when when you feel like it, but I would basically just continue holding as long as the quarterly chart remains in an uptrend. Uh, so, so yeah, in terms of taking profits on your, you know, on your actual portfolio, uh, probably I'd say the best thing to do is, and obviously this is not financial advice, but uh, you know, before we went over the, uh, the, the potential Bitcoin having projections. So, you know, when Bitcoin gets close to hundred thousand dollars, I guess that would be a good time to take some profits, and then, and then, yeah, yeah I mean, it's really, it's really up to, it's up to you, really, uh, when to take profits. Uh, me personally, I'm just gonna continue holding Bitcoin as long as we're in a quarterly uptrend. So, so yeah, I hope that, I hope that's helpful. Sure. Yeah, no, I think that's really helpful. So your plan is then when we do have a red quarter or maybe when it looks like we're going to have a red quarter, that's when you, I don't want to say jump ship, but that's when you sell um, and wait for the bear market, essentially wait a year or something. So, so looking at the quarterly chart, uh, yeah, even if we have like a red quarter, that wouldn't be an indication for me to sell. So, uh, so for example, we had uh, a pretty bad quarter in I guess the first half of 2022. So it was like following the FTX collapse. So we actually had a, a down move of 56%, which is you know pretty significant. Uh, but you can kind of still see that we still uh, you know we still remain in an uptrend. So really, you know, even if Bitcoin were to go down to uh, even if we have like a more significant pullback down to like 34,000 or 30,000 uh we would still be trading above you know the 21 th this yellow line here this is a 21 exponential moving average which is a pretty key moving average that i like to use uh for my trading uh you know just to see whether an asset is in an uptrend or in a downtrend uh so really as long as bitcoin can can remain above uh basically thirty thousand, i'll continue to hold uh however if we do start trading below Thirty-four thousand or thirty thousand for whatever reason, then, yeah, I'd probably you know, <laughs> probably something is really wrong in the in the in the markets overall, and I'd probably be looking to, yeah, probably be looking to sell at that point. But you can see, you know, we continue to make higher highs, and mm -hmm. uh, higher lows. So, uh, really, unless Bitcoin can, like, really take out. 30k the 30k level on a quarterly time frame i'll just yeah i'll, I'll continue holding my uh like my my long-term spa holdings great all right boris i appreciate you jumping on the channel we talked a lot about everything that's happening now and then even the cycle ahead uh when you might want to jump out of the market again i will leave links to your information underneath the video um also uh, for anyone that's wondering, you can get Boris's information uh, somewhat regularly, pretty regularly, in our CoinW uh, chat group on Telegram. 
there there's charts there's free live streams there's all kinds of technical analysis uh and boris you post in there as well correct yeah yeah um i actually i do post some uh, setups and just overall market analysis uh and really some of the trade setups i post i think they're, they're really good they've had quite a, a high hit rate uh because i do take uh, a lot of trades however the the trades that i do post to the actual telegram group those are kind of like my uh you know my my triple my triple a setups uh so to speak uh so uh yeah i'm i'm, pre I'm pretty proud of the uh of the trades that i post on there uh, so yeah, so definitely check out that channel. We also have analysts, uh, other analysts posting there, like uh, uh, Dylan and uh, Juan, uh, who uh, so so Dylan is in Dubai and uh, Juan is in uh, I believe in Spain. I'm in New York, so we basically have global coverage, pretty much twenty four seven for the uh, uh, you know the entire cryptocurrency space. Nice. And uh, that's completely free. When you sign up for CoinW underneath the video, you get access to that. Maybe you can tell people just for a minute why they'd want to use CoinW as well instead of maybe another crypto exchange or why they would want to use CoinW in general. Yeah, for sure. Uh, so, you know, I've been been a full time trader for over four time years. So I've used pretty much all the major exchanges, including uh, Binance and Bybit and even unfortunately ftx um and yeah i'm i'm uh i think coin w is a really really great exchange um just as it's probably even better than uh bybit and binance uh we have you know advanced order functions uh and also we have really great customer support so you know whenever there, there's an issue uh you know the support team is ready uh to to help help you guys out and also um when it comes to copy trading i think coin w has uh one of the best copy trading platforms uh because it really supports some advanced uh functions like uh, taking partial profits i actually have some friends who also do copy trading on other exchanges uh but uh on, the, on some of those other exchanges they don't support uh partial like profit taking which is you know a big problem for a trader like myself who does take partial profits um so so yeah i think uh coin w uh, is a great exchange in terms of liquidity and also the the copy trading engine is is really great it supports uh you know advanced order functions and yeah it's uh I, it's a great exchange and uh we're constantly adding new future spares and uh yeah we're constantly expanding uh so so yeah definitely be sure to check out coin w awesome Guys, give Boris some love in the comment section. Go follow him. Boris, thanks so much for coming on. We'll have to have you on in the future too. Yeah, thank you so much, Sam. It's been a, it's been a pleasure speaking with you. Awesome. See you soon. Bye.